Here we are, once again, taking another deep breath. Welcome, YouTube family. <clears throat> Breathing in, letting go, grounding into this present moment. Hmm. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So today I'm going to be starting our conversation with reading a little bit from Peace is Every Step, the Path of Mindfulness in Everyday Life by Thich Nhat Hanh. A beautiful, a beautiful book just with various excerpts of different topics that have a lot of wisdom, much like his book At Home in the World. <clears throat> so this one is called Flower Insights, and it's about the flower sermon that Buddha taught. There is a story about a flower which is well known in the Zen circles. One day the Buddha held up a flower in front of an audience of 1250 monks and nuns. He did not say anything for quite a long time. The audience was perfectly silent. Everyone seemed to be thinking hard, trying to see the meaning behind the Buddha's gesture. Then suddenly the Buddha smiled. He smiled because someone in the audience smiled at him and at the flower. He was the only person who smiled and the Buddha smiled back and said, I have a treasure of insight and I have trans transmitted it to this monk. That story has been discussed by many generations of Zen students and people continue to look for its meaning. To me, the meaning is quite simple. When someone holds up a flower and shows it to you, he wants you to see it. If you keep thinking, you miss the flower. The person who is not thinking, who is just himself, was able to encounter the flower in depth and thus smiled. That is the problem of life. If we are not fully ourselves, truly in the present moment, we miss everything. So this is a story that really encaptures the essence of what we've been learning for quite a while here, and that anytime you create a story or overanalyze anything, you're often missing the mark. So it can be from a place of overanalysis, or what we might call analysis paralysis, or you're being in the past, you're being in the future, and so you're never really fully alive in the moment. And Thich Nhat Hanh goes on to say, when a child presents himself to you with his smile, if you are not truly there, thus thinking about the future or the past, or preoccupied with other problems, then the child is not really present. The technique of being alive is to go back to yourself in order for the child to appear like a marvelous reality. Then you could see him smile and embrace him in your open arms. Who's ever done that to a child before? Maybe your own child or your own family or your own loved one. And it's interesting that when we're not alive in the moment, we completely miss those marks. And so it's so fascinating that that, uh, that happens. It even happens with animals. You know, there's times with Snow Angel, our dog, where she really wants to play and she's so happy. She's such a happy girl. And it's interesting where if I'm preoccupied in my mind, I'm missing that moment of aliveness. And then I, then I think of the future and I'm like, well, when she's gone, you know, there's going to, there's going to be that moment where I just want one more moment with her. I wish I was more present and alive. Now I probably, when she does pass, you know, years from now, hopefully it's interesting that I don't think I'll have a lot of regrets, but there's definitely moments with previous uh, animals that we've had that I, I wish I was more present for them and not in my own funk. And so you can have that relationship with the animals that you love and adore. You can have that relationship with the humans in your life that you love and adore. You can even have that relationship with your very own homes, the spirit of your home that many of us take for granted. And it's so interesting that no matter what environment we're in, there's often things that we're taking for granted because we're caught up in some storyline. So when Buddha held up that flower, you know, all the monks aside, or nuns beside one was trying to analyze and figure out the issue at hand. What was the teaching here? When really the teaching was in essence, just the aliveness of that. And there's a story very similar in Sokol Morinanga's book, Novice to Master, where he had a student go into his room after the student had cleaned it. And the student was freaking out. He's like, oh my God, I messed up. I'm going to get in trouble. You know, and then he went through the whole room seeing, you know, what did he not clean? What did he do inaccurately? So he was so caught up in the concern and the worry. And then he came back and he said, Master, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Why did you send me in the room? Everything was as it should be. And the... <laughs> Master said, did you see the flower in the vase on the desk and how the sunlight was hitting it? It was quite the beautiful moment, wasn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, the student did not even notice that at all. 
he was not able to see the beauty in that moment of the essence of that flower, which I don't doubt for one second that that master probably took inspiration from the flower sermon that Buddha gave, you know, thousands of years ago. So I just love the essence of that and being able to be fully alive in each moment. And I know I say that a lot, but were all of us fully alive each moment during the week? Probably not. <laughs> And so it's just a fantastic reminder. But then there's a couple chapters prior, which I'm just going to read a short excerpt from. And after a treat in Southern California, an artist asked me, what is the way to look at a flower so that I can make the most of it for my art? I said, if you look in that way, you cannot be in touch with the flower. Abandon all your projections so you can be with the flower with no intention of exploiting it or getting something from it. without exploiting it or getting something from it. Later on, he even goes on to say that we treat people in the same way. We're always looking for something from someone rather than showing up. Or maybe we're in the opposite situation where we're always giving something to someone. And so what I wrote down is, I'm here for you, or you're here for me, or simply two people saying, I'm here for you, right? That's, we can, I'm going to use this, a severe word, exploitation. We're always looking for that, that, that polarity of give and take, give and take, give and take, versus changing the storyline to a simple sentence of, we're here together, or I'm here with you. So think about that for a moment. Normally when we're in relationships, especially when we're emotionally tumultuous, tumultuous, that word, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for some validation, aren't we? We're looking for some appreciation, some acknowledgement. And I even wrote down here in like caps, I need to be heard in this relationship. Who's ever felt that way? <laughs> I need to feel appreciated. And then what's funny is it creates a dichotomy because every, every couple's relationship counseling I've ever worked with, the opposite partner says the damn same thing. So they're both looking to get the same damn thing from the relationship, maybe in slightly different ways because they may speak different love languages, but the partners are saying, I need this from you. And what's fascinating is what's, what's creating that dry spell, if you will, the dry spell of peace and love and affection and whatever in the marriage or relationship or friendship is that both parties are coming from a polarized idea of I need something from you. And whenever we have that energy of I need something from you, generally the opposite person feels even more drained. Because think about that. Has anyone ever asked something from you and then you get actually more drained because you've already given so much and you're just like, can't give anymore. <laughs> and it creates almost a resentment. And so when you change the storyline, and this is where semantics are really important, versus of saying, I need you to be there for me, or I'm here for you, we change the storyline to we're here together. And when you change the storyline to we're here together, what ends up happening is that it takes the emotional responsibility off of the other person and it places it in your own hand. Where I recognize that no one can ever give me a lasting sense of validation, satisfaction, happiness, sense of security, love, peace, appreciation, etc. It just doesn't work that way. I cannot fully ever receive that from anyone else. But what's fascinating is that when I learn to cultivate that within my own heart, when I learn to cultivate my own comfort, my own sense of security, my own sense of love, my own sense of peace, we stop worrying about those questions. And that's what's fascinating and that the deeper you go into this work, you stop worrying about what you're getting from other people because you recognize what you're getting from other people doesn't last. Even if you're in a loving relationship, you're still going to wake up feeling weird some days. And it's just no matter what anyone else, who's ever been called beautiful or handsome before, you didn't believe it. Right? It's like when people, even when people give you compliments, you can't even accept it and feel good about yourself until you fully believe it. But then even when you 
fully believe it. it and this is what's fascinating even people that really bring it on and you might call them narcissistic what's fascinating is narcissism actually comes from the poverty consciousness it actually comes from a lack and so even though they're always taking those fantastic pictures you know this is for the millennial generation with you know the, the social media all these things what's interesting is that that is actually coming from a lack and no matter how much they receive it will still not be enough but again, I've taught this before, when you actually, when a monk, when a, when someone, we'll just say Yoda, when Yoda look, when Master Yoda looks in the mirror, do you think he's worried about, you know, wow, you look good today? <laughs> or look good today, you do. <laughs> no, it doesn't go in that direction. When someone has inner peace and they look in the mirror, there is not a belittlement, but there's also not an inflation. There is just a natural at peaceness. I am here in this moment. This moment exists, this moment. There doesn't need to be an added storyline. Not sure why I went in that little rant direction, but maybe someone in this <laughs> audience or someone listening at home, that will help. <laughs> Some of my, that was not in my notes, damn it, but here we are. But again, I just really wanna point that out. I'm here for you versus you're here for me versus we're here together versus I'm here with you. And then you can even just break that down fully into togetherness just togetherness. Who's ever shared togetherness with someone it was quiet and it was peaceful and there was nothing left needed to say? That is a beautiful thing. And that's an energy that we really want to create a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Let's take a breath. And now what I'm gonna be teaching is almost, uh, what's what I'm looking for? A paradox. Because I was just saying, I'm here for you, you're here for me, let that go. But now I'm going to be teaching you, which I've taught before, but hopefully today I'm going to teach it in a way that will be more effective, is the love question in my book, because this week's topic is ignorance is illusion, we seek understanding. We're on the fourth tenet, and the practice is the love question, which is how can I love you better? <laughs> so you can see how the question, how can I love you better, is a paradox from what I was just teaching you. But again, there's a time and a place for everything. And the reason why I love the how can I love you better question is it actually creates a humility of the self. It creates a humbleness. And in this instance, it is useful to stop worrying. It is helpful to stop worrying about what am I getting from other people and rather of what can I bring more to the situation. And again, the word more and the word better definitely creates a little bit of a dichotomy. But again, there's a time and place for everything. And this actually is a very useful question that kind of breaks us out of our own egoic grasping for things and just being fully present. And so let me go ahead and read. The question is, how can I love you better? Although better is somewhat a somewhat a comparing judgment, we nonetheless like to use this question as it invites a humbling attitude combined with gentle curiosity and compassion. In the student program, we really dive into what gentle curiosity and compassion means. It's important to ask people in our life this question or various form of this question to promote deeper understanding between ourselves and others. Following this question may come requests for presence, appreciation, acknowledgement, etc. Again, we're creating that weird polarized energy there. But whatever these requests may be, it is our responsibility to either agree to meet these requests or explain thoroughly why we may not be able to meet them and instead offer alternative solutions. The reason why I love this practice is because it creates a dialogue that often doesn't exist. Many times we're asking for things without explaining why. Many things we're asking for love, but we don't know exactly what love means to us. And so who's ever said the sentence to someone, you're just not listening to me, or you know, I just don't feel loved by you, I don't feel appreciated. We'll say these sharp things, but often we're not actually coming up with a solution. We're never taking the time to teach people how to love us. Do you really hear that? We don't te take the time to teach people how to love us effectively or how to be in a loving relationship with someone. And part of that issue comes back to because we don't actually know ourselves. We don't actually know how to ourselves and we also don't actually know ourselves. And that's where the meditation techniques that I've been teaching, especially Wednesday nights, are gonna be very helpful with because they bring us 
out, they bring us into an objective observation moment. And for those of you listening at home, you can watch last week's video. We kind of talk about the objective observation. When you enter into an objective space of not adding a storyline, it's this, it, an interesting thing starts to happen is that there's just a, an unveiling that starts to occur. You kind of just enter into the moment and then insights just, you're not trying to force insights, but they naturally just start to come because you're not grasping for anything. You're not trying to reach for the storyline, much like how Buddha was holding up the flower. And in that moment without analysis, the insight was delivered. So really hear that for a moment in that we are asking for things, we're requesting for, for things from the world, from our loved partners, etc., our family members, but we're never fully taking the time to explain. I feel most loved when X, Y, and Z is met. And maybe X, Y, and Z is acknowledgement and appreciation. But then you have to break that down even more. What is acknowledgement to you? What is appreciation to you? And then you break that down. Well, for me, it's when you do these acts of service. It's when uh, I ask for the dishwasher to be un uh, unloaded, and then I only have to ask once, and it's just done. But then you're going to say, well, Alaric, I always say that. I say that every day. Maybe that is one of the points of contention in the household, that I don't have enough help around the house. But again, more often than not, we're, we're expressing it from a place of telling and demanding <laughs> and a place of frustration and a, phrase, a, a place of contention rather than really breaking it down and saying, I've noticed that over the years or over the months, whenever I ask something and then it's not done, this is, this is the manifestation of how it makes me feel. And it actually really makes me feel unheard in this relationship or this marriage or this household. And these are the thoughts that come up. So you're explaining your mental process to your partner. And so what I'm asking you is it's quite a serious thing because I'm asking you to actually enter into therapy sessions with each other. <laughs> in a sense where you actually start having the type of conversation that you would in therapy, but with your partner. In therapy, we learn how to understand our psychology, but in our marriages and our relationships and our family dynamics, what's interesting is the, the number one thing that's often not talked about is our own psychology. We don't explain our triggers. We don't explain how our triggers get triggered. We don't explain the feelings that come from our triggers get triggered. We don't, I could keep going, but you get the point where there is so much ignorance in marriages and in family units because there's this lack of conversation happening. And not even the lack of conversation, there's an avoidance of conversation that often arises. Even in very open households, there's often an avoidance of the very deep, uncomfortable things that hurt us. One of the most damaging things that even I have to take a breath because it breaks my heart is that so many people over the years I've worked with that have suffered sexual abuse, when they, the first thing they go and they tell their parent, well, not always, but the times that some people have shared with me, they tell their parents, this has happened many times, the parents deny it or they, they try to justify it. And then it, adds further wounding to the child. But do you know why the parent denies it? Because the parent is, it's, an, it's a defense mechanism. Because the, if the parent fully accepted that truth, they'd feel like a failure. And so it's a lot easier to pretend that that didn't happen. And guess what? That happens a lot, not only in that severe situation, but a lot of times when our partner is trying to explain something to us of maybe something that we could be doing better, it, it triggers our egoic response of defensiveness because we don't want to feel like a failure. Or when our child is unhappy, our child is doing things that are out of control and they're, they're going through their angst, we'll just say. And it may not even come from any specific abuse. Again, we don't want to sit in the discomfort of things or fully acknowledge it because it makes us so uncomfortable. So we create stories of denial around it. Really hear that. Think of the ways in which you have denied truths because they trigger something within you and you just don't like talking about it. I could just throw out the word religion and politics and <laughs> it shuts people down. It's interesting, isn't it? Anything that really hear this, anything that disagrees with our reality of what we think reality is often creates a shutting down energy within ourselves. And if we're not careful, if we don't catch, catch it, you're going to notice that yourself is shutting down or the person that you're talking to is shutting down. Who's ever brought something up 
to someone they shut down, <laughs> right? And that's how we know, ooh, I'm touching a core wound here. Let me take a step back, take a breath. Let me adjust the way that I'm talking. Let me soften my approach of how I'm approaching this difficult conversation. And you might notice that a blooming will start to occur, maybe a little bit more of an unfolding of that flower energy, and then you can resume the conversation. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the times, if someone is just shutting down in front of us, we just let it go because it's like, that's not my responsibility. <laughs> but here's where we're a bit inaccurate. If you're in a marriage, if you're in a family unit, if you're in a community, we all take part in that responsibility together. And it's not always about them fully understanding the insight and the awareness and going to therapy. Sometimes you can actually be the one that helps lead into this unfolding experience. And so think about it. No matter, is it the knocking of the door that matters the most? Or is it how am I knocking? Think about that. Many of us just think, well, I knocked and I tried, so fuck it. Excuse my language. Or is it more effective to say, I knocked and the first try didn't work, so I'm going to try a different way to knock. And then the next time I'll try a different way to knock. And the next time I'm going to try a different way to knock. Had I not approached that in building communities, this, this community that we're experiencing today would not even exist. Because there's been times where I've knocked and work. And I tried another thing, knocked it. Okay, we'll try this one. Same thing with having a happy marriage, a marriage that is at peace with each other. Took me a hundred tries. <laughs> Maybe not a hundred, but it took many tries before I met Anne. And what's interesting is every single person before I met Andrew, my mindset was, what can they give to me? Or what can I fully give to them? And again, there's the dichotomy. There's the paradox. Now, it's not, we don't even think about giving and receiving. It just, it's just we're here together. And when we're fully listening to each other, things just naturally arise and naturally get done. Does that make sense? So let's take a breath. Even when we think that we are loving well, asking this love question opens up a deepening dialogue between people that build stronger bridges of communication and invokes greater conscious expansion and connection. Thich Nhat Hanh, this is a quote I'm going to go ahead and say. Understanding and love are not two separate things, but just one. To develop understanding, you have to practice looking at all living beings with eyes of compassion. When you understand, you cannot help but love. And when you love, you naturally act in a way that relieves the suffering of other people. When you understand, you cannot help but love. When you understand, you cannot help but love. But the understanding only arises when we release our notion of offense and defense. You're not loving me good enough shuts us down. And I'm doing everything that I can. And I'm already loving you enough shuts us down versus I'm releasing all notions in this conversation. I'm releasing all ideas in this conversation. Tell me what's on your heart. Just lay it all out. And even don't worry about offending me. Don't worry about offending me. Just lay it all out there and fully listen. That's where understanding comes from, not from your own opinion on what you think you're doing well or unwell, just fully listening. And from that understanding, love is born. And when we love, we naturally act in ways that relieve suffering of the ones around us. I had to learn that with my parents, actually, because I was a kid that would come home, even as an adult, and I would complain. I'd bitch about my day. But every time I noticed that I would drive to their house, and if it was my safe place to vent, but then it hurt them. And then I would see that they would be put in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> and then there might be some bickering there, right? So I was bringing my suffering and not fully taking responsibility for it and giving it to someone else. And it makes sense as children. We're like, of course, we're going to give our suffering to our family. But I'm an adult now, and I can learn how to effectively heal that for myself. So when I learned to do that, our family dynamic increased exponentially. So now there might be times where I might ask, I really just need to vent right now. But I always just claim up front. Now I try to only bring peace into the home. And someone might say, well, Alaric, but that's what family's for. I'm like, hmm, that's our Western idea of family. 
that you just throw your baggage and your shit on everyone and you just make them deal with it because that's what love is. Love does not make people suffer. And that is really important to hear. True love does not lead to suffering. True love, when you're applying true love, it leads to peace and everyone benefits. So maybe if we change that dialogue of understanding what love actually is, we'll stop making excuses for ourselves. Really hear that. We'll stop making excuses for ourselves when we realize that when, our, when, we, think our, when we think we're in love, but it's leading to suffering, it's not love. And that's an okay, it might be scary to acknowledge that, but that gives us ability to transmute it into love now. We're fully seeing it for what it is, it's ego. <laughs> but then when my love is leading to peace and there's a byproduct of peace, then I can rest knowing that we're on the path. So peace, pain, that's, it's not about right, wrong, good or bad. It's not about the moral objections with things. It's simply about peace, pain, peace, pain. Is this leading to further harm or is this leading to further peace? And that's why a lot of families don't heal because they're using love as an excuse for their non-alignment. What's that? It, it was, it, it's quoted by Marilyn Monroe, but it's actually not her, by the way. It, it, everyone thinks it is, but it's not by her. It's that quote, if you can't love me at my worst, if you can't handle me or love me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Can't stand that quote. Absolutely not helpful because that means that the person needs to be able to handle you at your worst. And the truth is no one deserves your worst. No one deserves your worst. Maybe you've given your worst to people in the past and you worked through it, great, that's beautiful. But now we know, now we know, no one deserves to be abused because of our emotional suffering. And then we say, well, we've suffered so much, we might as well get married because we've seen each other's at our worst. <laughs> who's ever justified, who's ever heard anyone justify marriage in that way or getting married or staying married? I hear that a lot and I actually almost did that. We've been through so much together. We might as well just keep going. And sure, there are situations where that does happen and it leads to a happily ever after the karma is healed. But in a lot of cases, we see where that just keeps the suffering alive. Let's take a breath. So again, don't make any rash decisions based off of what I'm saying today. <laughs> Really just here, I'm just trying to explain the psychology behind it. So the purpose of today's conversation is to understand more what love is, but also understanding what we can do starting today. What we can do starting today to actually activate loving presence, so rather than creating the notions of what we think is right or wrong, good or bad, or whether we think we're loving enough or not loving enough. We still ask the question and we just open up the dialogue for people to let us know. We start having those deeper conversations. So one more thing I wanted to share. Who's ever gotten into trouble with hope before? What? Hope. Where you have this idea of the future that things are gonna work out and then they may or may not. <clears throat> so the last thing I'll share is this excerpt, hope as an obstacle. Hope is, in, hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to hear or less difficult to bear. If we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bury hardship today, but that is, the, that is the most that hope can ever do for us, to make some hardships lighter. When I think deeply about the nature of hope, I see something tragic. Since we cling to our hope in the future, we do not focus our energies and capabilities in the present moment. We use hope to believe something better will happen in the future, that we will arrive at peace or the kingdom of God. Hope becomes a kind of obstacle. If you can refrain from hoping, you can bring yourself entirely into the present moment and discover the joy that is already here. Enlightenment, peace, and joy will not be granted by someone else. The well is within us. Our civilization so much focuses on tomorrow, the next day, hoping for a better. You can create the life you've always dreamed. You know, follow your dreams, all of these things. And hope is a beautiful thing, but at the same time, hope without action, hope without action, hope without action, hope without action, nothing changes. So I hope my marriage will improve. I hope my relationship will improve. I hope this will improve. We just, we always put, I hope dot, 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 fill in the blank of anything. It could be one of those fun word games. Just fill in the blank. You're going to suffer because if we're focused on hope without action, we're not actually doing the things that are helping us to. So let's take a breath. Mm. 
And breathing in, letting go. One more breath. So your call to action this week, ask someone in your life, how can I love you better? But see if you can ask it from an angle of, you're not worrying about right or wrong, good or bad, better or less than. I know the word better is in it, but it's just there to, words are just difficult creatures. But it's there to humble us in that moment and just open up a dialogue. Maybe you're going to actually say, how can I appreciate you better? Maybe love is too strong of a word for a certain relationship. How can I appreciate you better? Or how, can, how would you feel more seen and heard in this friendship? How would you feel more seen and heard in this work environment? And so create a dialogue, remove the notion of how you think you're doing and fully listen to someone's suffering that you're close to. And you're gonna actually be revealed some nugget of information and you're able to go deeper into it. I've had this conversation many times before on Sundays here, but maybe today something else will click for you and then you can go a little bit deeper into it. And that's why we repeat ourselves. <laughs> so I hope we gain a little insight here. And next week, we're going to go ahead and go into chaos, inclusion, and see harmony. And this Wednesday night, I'll be teaching our objective observation mindfulness technique along with the second harm. I'm teaching the five harms on Wednesdays. And the second harm is how our harm uh, can arrive from when we spill our emotional energy onto those around us. Last week was intentional harm, the ways that we say things that are hurtful on purpose. And this is how we cause harm when we're just spilling our energy onto people around us because we're not taking that full responsibility or we're not fully aware. So exciting stuff for Wednesday and next Sunday. We'll see you next week. Thank you as always. Links are below for any donations you'd like to share. That's amazing.